Hey everyone, this is Nick from the Botch Pit. Today we're going to be talking about the Loyalists of Thule, a compact for Hunter the Vigil. They are also known as the Indebted. As a terminology reminder, compacts are second tier hunter organizations, setting them above bands of hunters called cells and below conspiracies, which are the largest types of hunter organizations. Before we begin, I just want to be clear that this compact, more so than most others, deals with history in a very sensitive way. What I'm saying is this, remember that some things can be a sensitive issue for both players and storytellers. In the world of darkness, everything is intended to be darker, meaner, and weirder than the real world, but don't let it bleed into each other. Today, we're dealing with Nazis, complexity in organization, real world history. As a disclaimer, let me reiterate that I am but a simple, incredibly humble tabletop educator. I'm not a substitute for a history book. However, if the History Channel calls, I would 100% go on with Giorgio Tsuklos. We have the same haircut. For the sake of this video's length, I can't go into the sheer extent of history of what is really required on the subject, but I wanted to give you somewhat of a basis to begin understanding how this all relates back to Hunter the Vigil. Truthfully, if this part interests you, investigate it much, much further. The Thule Society, Thule Gesellschaft, originally Studiengruppe für Germanisches Altertum, study group for Germanic antiquity, was a German occultist and Völkisch group founded in Munich right after World War I, named after a mythical northern country in Greek legend. The Latin term Ultima Thule is also mentioned by Roman poet Virgil in his pastoral poems called the Georgics. Thule was a land located by Greco-Roman geographers in the farthest north, often displayed as Iceland. However, it originally was probably the name for Scandinavia, although Virgil simply uses it as a proverbial expression for the edge of the known world. The Thule Society identified Ultima Thule as a lost ancient landmass in the extreme north, near Greenland or Iceland, said by Nazi mystics to be the capital of ancient Hyperborea. The society is most notably known as the organization that sponsored the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, the German Workers' Party, which was later recognized by Adolf Hitler into the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party. According to Hitler biographer Ian Kershaw, the organization's members list reads like a who's who of early Nazi sympathizers and leading figures in Munich, including Rudolf Hess, Alfred Rosenberg, Hans Frank, Ulis Lehmann, Gottfried Fieder, Dietrich Eckhart, and Karl Haar. According to Johannes Herring, however, there is no evidence that Hitler ever attended the Thule Society. The Thule Society was originally a German study group headed by Walter Nahaus, a wounded World War I veteran turned art student from Berlin who had become a keeper of pedigrees for the German Norden, or Order of Tuchens, a secret society founded in 1911 and formally named in the following year. In 1917, Nahaus moved to Munich and his Thule Society was to be a cover name for the Munich branch of the German Norden. However, events developed differently as a result of a schism in the order. In 1918, Nahaus was contacted contacted in Munich by Rudolf von Sympathendorf, or von Sympathendorf, an occultist and newly elected head of the Bavarian province of the schism offshoot known as the German Norden, Valveta of the Holy Grail. The two men became associates in a recruitment campaign, and Sympathendorf adopted Nahaus's Thule Society as a cover name for his Munich lodge of the German Norden, Valdewer at its formal dedication on August 18, 1918. Also, side note, I had never spoke German once in my life before, so I'm doing my best on this. This being said, if I accidentally pronounce something wrong, I apologize. Please, I'm from Boston. We don't even say our R's here. Beliefs. A primary focus of the Thule Society was a claim concerning the origins of the Aryan race. In 1917, people who wanted to join the Germanic order, out of which the Thule Society developed in 1918, had to sign a special blood declaration of faith concerning their lineage. It read, the signer hereby swears to the best of his knowledge and belief that no Jewish or colored blood flows in either his or in his wife's veins, and that among their ancestors are no members of the colored races. Activities. The Thule Society attracted about 250 followers in Munich and about 1,500 elsewhere in Bavaria. The followers of the Thule Society were very interested in racial theory and, in particular, in combating Jews and communists. Sembattendorf also planned, but failed, to kidnap Bavarian Socialist Prime Minister Kurt Eisner in December 1918. During the Bavarian Revolution of April 1919, Thulis were accused of trying to infiltrate its governments and of attempting a coup. On April 26, the communist government in Munich raided the society's premises and took seven of its members into custody, executing them on April 30th. 
Amongst them were Walter Nahaus and four well-known aristocrats, including Countess Hela von Werfstock, who functioned as the group's secretary, and Prince Gustav of Thurn in Texas, who was related to several European royal families. In response, the Thule organized a citizen's uprising as troops entered the city on May 1st. Menhi Nabo o Bakhtan newspaper. Again, please be merciful on these pronunciations. In 1918, the Thule Society bought a local weekly newspaper, the Mehi Nabo Bobakta, and changed its name to Mehi Nabo Bobakta und Sportsblatt, Munich Observer and Sports Paper, in an attempt to improve its circulation. This would later become the Volkischer Bobakta, Volkisch Observer, the main Nazi newspaper. It was edited by Karl Harar. Deutsch Abatapata. Anton Drexler had developed links between the Thule Society and various extreme right workers' organizations in Munich. He established the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, German Workers' Party, on January 5, 1919, together with the Thule Society's Karl Harrer. Adolf Hitler joined this party in September of the same year. By the end of February 1920, it had been reconstituted as the National Socialist German Workers' Party, often referred to as the Nazi Party. Sebattendorf by then had left the Thule Society and never joined either of these. Dietrich Brodner alleged that other members of the Thule Society were later prominent in Nazi Germany. The list includes Dietrich Eckhart, who coached Hitler on his public speaking skills, along with Erich Jan Hanussen, and had Mein Kampf dedicated to him as well as Gottfried Federer, Hans Frank, Hermann Göring, Karl Haushofer, Rudolf Hess, Heinrich Himmler, and Alfred Rosenberg. Historian Nicholas Guderich Clark has described his membership role in similar claims as spurious and fanciful, noting that Federer, Eckhart, and Rosenberg were never more than guests to whom the Thule Society extended hospitality during the Bavarian Revolution of 1918, although he has more recently acknowledged that Hess and Frank were members of the society before they came to prominence in the Nazi party. It has also been claimed that Adolf Hitler himself was a member. However, evidence on the contrary shows that he never attended a meeting, as attested to by the Johannes Herring's Diary of Society Meetings. It is quite clear that Hitler himself had little interest in and made little time for esoteric matters. If you want to go further with this, check out Hitler's Nuremberg speech of September 6, 1938, on his disapproval of occultism. Wilhelm Laforce and Max Sesselmann, staff on that newspaper I can't pronounce, were Thule members who later joined the Nazi party. Dissolution Early in 1920, Karl Herrer was forced out as Hitler moved to serve the party's link with the Thule Society, which subsequently fell into decline and was dissolved about five years later, well before Hitler came to power. Rudolf von Sebettendorf had withdrawn from the Thule Society in 1919, but he returned to Germany in 1933 in hopes of reviving it. In that year, he published a book entitled Bevor Hitler Kam, Before Hitler Came, in which he claimed that the Thule Society had paved the way for the Führer. Thuleers were the ones to whom Hitler came first, and Thuleers were the first to unite themselves with Hitler. This claim was not favorably received by the Nazi authorities. After 1933, esoteric organizations were suppressed, including Volkisch cultists, many closed down by anti-Masonic legislation in 1935. Zimbettendorf's book was prohibited, and he himself was arrested and imprisoned for a short period in 1934, afterwards departing into exile in Turkey. Nonetheless, it has been argued that some Thule members and their ideas were incorporated into the Third Reich. A few of the Thule Society's teachings were expressed in the books of Alfred Rosenberg. Any occult ideas found favor with Heinrich Himmler, who had a great interest in mysticism, unlike Hitler. But the Schwarzstaffel SS, under Himmler, emulated the structure of Ignatius Loyola's Jesuit order rather than the Thule Society. Conspiracy Theories the Thule Society has become the center of many conspiracy theories concerning Nazi Germany, due to its occult background, like the Ennenerber section of the SS. Now that was a think tank that operated in Nazi Germany between 1935 and 1945. It was an appendage of the Schwarzstaffel, and had been established by Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsführer of the SS. It was devoted to the task of promoting the racial doctrines espoused by Adolf Hitler and his governing Nazi party, specifically by supporting the idea that the modern Germans descended from an ancient Aryan race, which is biologically superior to other racial groups. The group comprised scholars and scientists from a broad range of academic disciplines. Such theories include the creation of real-powered Nazi UFOs. Falsehoods 
Appendix E of Goodrich Clark's book is entitled The Modern Mythology of Nazi Occultism. In his words, these books describe Hitler and the Nazis as being controlled by a hidden power, characterized either as a discontent entity, like a black force in visible hierarchies, unknown superiors, or as a magical elite in a remote age or distant location. He referred to the writers of this genre as crypto historians. The works of this genre, he wrote, were typically sensational and under-researched. A complete ignorance of the primary sources was common to most authors, and inaccuracies and wild claims were repeated by each newcomer to the genre until an abundant literature existed, based on wholly spurious facts concerning the powerful Thule society, the Nazi links with the East, and Hitler's occult initiation. So, why did I say all of this? At this point in the video, you're probably wondering why I'm giving you a history lesson, as opposed to teaching you about the game. The Loyalists of Thule, a group dedicated to the hunt for supernatural creatures, are based on the remnants of the Thule society in Hunter the Vigil. The book gives you approximately one paragraph for all this historical information. Without this context, if going by the book, this compact doesn't appear as dynamic as they ought to be. Going forward, we're going to blend the Thule society with fictional Chronicles of Darkness concepts. The History of the Loyalists of Thule Organization of Compact This is how you get into the Loyalists of Thule. Somebody in your family messed around with the occult, or you messed around with the occult, and bad things happened. Because bad things happened, now you owe, and you owe big. If you're in the Compact because of family, that probably means that a couple generations back, a family member belonged to the Thule Society and watched as his group picked up bad ideas, ideas that eventually led to the founding of the German National Socialist Party, the Nazis. There are, like, so many medals in there, dude. This guy was probably, like, King Nazi. It doesn't matter that the Nazis eventually rebuked the occult and made the study of it illegal. What matters is that the Thule Society's original ethos was a springboard for one of the greatest evils to have walked the earth in recent history. They answer to secretive leaders, each of whom controls a compact on a national level, and those leaders defer to the three founders who still reside in Germany. The founders, three men, all reside in Munich and are all over 90 years old. These three surviving loyalists have only each other, and each other hates the other two passionately, as a reminder of his guilt and the task he set himself. The three old men of Munich do not exactly run the compact. After all, the compact more or less runs itself. What they do is watch, collect, and disseminate. Their names? Otto Lands, Christopher Daumler, and Elios Steger. A hunter may actually take one of them as a mentor, but shouldn't expect to have an easy or pleasant mentorship. The old men have secret retainers throughout the compact. These retainers collect information and pass it to them. The old men then determine if the information is worth distributing or keeping wholly secret. If they distribute, they then pass it through the chain of those who need to know. If they keep it secret, it goes into a folder or a notebook and locked away in a vault. The information in this vault is often called the Archive or Das Archive. The Loyalists of Thule the Loyalists of Thule spent the first decades of the last century looking for the ultimate source to their eternal shame. Back then, they were the Thule Gesellschaft, a German occult group that took its belief in that the ultimate source to its eventual conclusion, that a master race had descended from lost Thule, the Aryans were the oldest and most highly evolved of people, and the perfect Aryans were the German people. And then, two of their members founded the German Workers' Party, which, in a couple years, became the Nazi Party. By the time the Nazis came to power, none of their leaders had anything to do with the Thule society, contrary to popular belief. In the end, the Nazis banned mystical societies and eschewed the occult, ultimately suppressing Thule society's literature. The majority of the Thule society's members dispersed, leaving a minority to hang on illegally to face the horrors their theories and philosophies had wrought. When the truth came out at the end of the war, some didn't believe it. Some denied it and joined even less savory, folkish societies, and some admitted they were wrong. Their horror at what their actions had helped create was compounded by the fact that throughout the 1920s and 30s, their studies had actually borne fruit. They had discovered the true existence of ancestral ghosts. Some had met the ghosts of the Romhaus, the tribesmen who had roamed lost Atlantis and fought in the armies of the Sorcerer Kings. Some had sneaked into Tibet and found evidence of Shambhala, barely escaping with their lives. Some had narrowly escaped confrontations with spirits summoning witches, demons, werewolves, vampires, and other, even more bizarre things. There was a secret world, a world of the night, and the Volkish weren't any kind of master race. The newly reformed Loyalists of Thule stopped looking for Atlantis, instead seeking out to find out more about this invisible world. 
the loyalists have to know. They find the truth about the monsters and they pass it on. If they can save the human race, maybe they can atone for their part in the making of a century that almost destroyed us. They owe it to the human race. They are indebted and they will never make the full payment. It's not that the loyalists like blackmailing their new members. It's just that if they are to atone for what they are, they have to keep themselves secret. The loyalists of Thule are scholars first, above all, but still, it's not really the Loyalist's job to face the enemy. They exist to equip others to that end. Most of the Loyalists of Thule hook up with other hunters, either individuals or members of compacts, such as the Union, the Long Knight, or Network Zero. They sometimes join them in the field, but really, they're the people who give advice on how their companions can defeat their foes. Understanding is key, and the Loyalists recognize that different kinds of supernatural creatures pose different kinds of threats. Corpses that consume blood, flesh, and souls to exist receive a lot of attention from the Loyalists. Werewolves, particularly the kind who, apparently, breed true, don't always pose a threat to humans if they're left alone. Demons, ghosts, spirits, and the kind of eldritch entities that invade from other dimensions, however, have no business existing. They need to be studied and, once their weaknesses are found, the Loyalists need to destroy them or find someone who can. Even if a supernatural creature is not a threat to anyone, it's still worth studying. Knowledge is knowledge, and secrets are always worth knowing. If the indebted find a creature or organization that either still ideologically supports Nazi ideals, or even takes part in the things that happened, all bets are off. Ordinary human hate groups fall under the same category as monsters. They're not hasty. They stick to the shadows. They watch. They learn. When they hunt, they hunt intelligently, setting traps, playing monsters against one another, and going armed with as much information as humanly possible. All told, it's worth asking though, why are they so cautious? What gives them pause, causing them to act so judiciously in the hunt? Thule society occultists have taken up the acts of penance and now carry the vigil to help combat the evils of the world, both supernatural and natural. It all adds up to a very big oops, and someone has to foot the bill. That's you. One thing this compact values above all else is responsibility. The loyalists are not. Nazis, and they hate that they have that reputation. The problem is, Nazism still thrives. It thrives among humans. Neo-Nazi white power movements continue to pop up and gain momentum. It thrives among monsters. Some creatures glom onto the Nazi brand as a source of pliable human minds, or see it as a way to conjure up old evils and powerful hatreds. Above all, that is the enemy that the Loyalists fight. Anytime they discover Nazism thriving, they stamp it out. Dule was a Nordic equivalent to Atlantis, a place where a race of giant men created wonders of technology and civilization that remain unparalleled even in this modern age. It was a place of powerful magic, occult engineering, and ancient secrets. So, to search for Thule is now a metaphor for attempting to uncover lost truths and potent secrets. All that being said, some loyalists go beyond the metaphor of Thule and, well, continue to search for Thule itself. They claim that the ghosts of Thule's giant supermen are actually still around if you care to risk life and limb finding one, in that those strange ghosts possess earth-shattering secrets. Philosophies in general, the Loyalists are far less divided than other compacts or conspiracies. For the most part, the members of this group are all on the same page. Most of the Loyalists of Thule are simply scholars, free specialty, academics, or occult research. Their approach to the vigil may seem passive, until one realizes that they sometimes have to detonate walls and decapitate shambling mummy zombies just to get an old papyrus scroll. For the most part, these hunters do not form entire cells. Rather, one or two members try to become part of other cells, always keeping their true affiliation secret as their debt is shameful in order to bolster the efforts of those cells with knowledge. This is next level secret Hitler. Secret. The biggest secret is that the scholars know too much, and they keep a lot of it to themselves. Overall, the knowledge they possess is incredibly dangerous. Anybody could use it for terrible effect. Awakening old vampires, or plundering Hyperborean tombs, or getting cocky and trying to trap an elder demon, and losing it on the world instead. So, they keep this stuff very closely guarded, which is a secret that other hunter organizations would not like to learn. The penitents are more proactive, they're the gun-toting archaeologists of popular culture, the tomb raiders and barnstormers who put themselves in terrible danger to learn ancient secrets. Free specialty, firearms, pistol. The penitents form something of an unofficial club within the loyalists. You want in? Fine. You get a pistol. A Nazi pistol. Like a Luger or a Walther P-38. It's not meant to be a joke or an homage. It's meant to remind you that this pistol killed people. 
that had shot American soldiers and Jews and French resistance and whoever else got in its way. They're less content to bolster other hunters and feel more indebted to fix what's broken themselves. Secret, those Nazi pistols that the penitent possess? Most don't like to talk about it, more than a few of those pistols are haunted. Not just by one ghost, but by a whole host of lost souls. Those voices are in that weapon. They strive for release. They remind the hunter of guilt. It drives some loyalists mad. It's the penitents who do the dirty work, but often it's the advance, on the other hand, who leads them. Members of the advance accept the guilt of the loyalists of Dulé and reason that yes, the loyalists need to atone, but if they're going to make up for the organization's past sins, they should be at the forefront of the struggle. Free specialty, persuasion, leadership. Tiv, and some might say cocky, approach to resolving debts, which is that to truly balance the scales of the compact has to put itself not just in the thick of the fight, but at its fore. Leading the way not only opens oneself to great errors, but is also the same cocky thinking, so the argument goes, that got the original Thule society into the Nazi mess to begin with. Secret. Everyone suspects that this faction secretly harbors some neo-Nazis. They don't. They're just so stridently opposed to intrusion by fascist notions as any, maybe more so because they're so damn defensive about it. What they are interested in, however, is putting the loyalists of Thule back on the map as far as a legitimate occult society goes. Status. Loyalists of Thule gain status simply by learning occult secrets and sharing them. One dot, when you successfully risk willpower on a role using academics or occult, gain two additional willpower points instead of one. This can take you above your willpower dots, but any unspent willpower over your maximum disappears at the end of the scene. Three dot, you gain two dots in the mentor merit. This reflects a more experienced member of the loyalists. Five dot, you gain three instances of the context merit. These reflect ranking specialists in the loyalists. Each must be designated to a specific type of supernatural issue. Systems. Loyalist Endowment Unearth Secrets 1 to 5 This isn't a group that suffers from a lot of infighting or paranoia. They share information, and they share it broadly. The more information one is willing to share in return, the higher he places himself on the chain of unearthed secrets. He can, for free, gain a number of important secrets about the monsters or about other hunters where appropriate, equal to the dots possessed in this merit. This is a great place for the storyteller to see new plot points and information, as well as for the loyalists to learn information that is useful to previous stories. This endowment also has a side benefit that can be used throughout a story as well. It is, in effect, an occult context merit. It works just like the context merit, except each dot is geared towards character types with occult specialties. Bonus material, the Rom House. The Rom House are the ghosts of the Thulis Giants, who are in turn, apparently, a subrace of Atlantean descendants. Tombs of the Rom House. The tombs are well concealed and most often subterranean. They can be found in the pagan barrows and ancient catacombs of Northern Europe. The lead up to each tomb is lined with elaborate traps, pits that drop onto floors of jagged quartz crystals, half-moon blades of a tarnished silver swinging out of wall slits, ancient gears ready to grind up those that fall into them. Awakening the Rom House The Ghost Slumber To awaken one and make it manifest, at least initially, one must sacrifice something. One must sacrifice a magical item. In Hunter the Vigil terms, this means a relic of three dots or higher, which, yes, can put the loyalists at odds with the Aegis Kaidoru. The Thulis Spectres In some way, the ghosts of the Rom House are like any other ghosts. They exist largely in Twilight until they manifest. They possess Numina, most have five or more. Yes, Chris, they have Numina. They are anchored to this world by their tombs. And yet, it's not hard to spot the differences. First, they're huge. They are twice the size of normal men when manifested, size 10. Second, they look human-ish. But they are clearly not human. Their flesh is pale and sickly, with a blue or yellowish cast, depending on the Rumhau. Their two eyes appear blind and covered with cataracts, but the third eye in the middle of their expansive foreheads remains wide open, casting about as if paranoid. They are naked and possess both sets of genitals, male and female, because the book oddly says this one given detail, yet fails to fully explain the historical significance of this group. Priorities. Finally, the weirdest part is their mouths. Their teeth are a tangle of barbed fangs, and their tongues are marked with strange symbols and prayers written in dead languages. Third, they're maybe insane or hypersane, or just possess a sanity from a world past. They don't make much sense. They speak in songs, in tongues, in grating sounds, and in animal cries, a bizarre pastiche of noises. Curiously, despite this communication barrier, a Romhel ghost will understand a hunter just fine. Fourth, 
Communicating with a ROM HAL can damage one's sanity. Contact with a ROM HAL incurs an instant mild derangement, a derangement that remains with the character until it can be resolved naturally through therapy or willpower expenditure. Worse, the hunter's own morality is in peril. If the hunter has to make a degeneration roll within the next seven days after encountering a ROM HAL, he loses one die on the roll because he feels distanced from the act that compelled the degeneration attempts to begin with. So, what is the benefit in all of this? Well, two potential benefits occur. First, these mad occult engineers were said to conjure the physical world into being by the power of the Logos, the Word. Simply by singing or speaking, they could create things. Their ghosts retain this power. If the hunter requires some object or item, or even another individual, alive or dead, the Romhal can conjure it just by speaking its name. It's real. It's permanent, at least until destroyed. It works flawlessly. It isn't some cursed copy. Second, this ability extends to conjuring any piece of information into existence. Instead of asking for an object, the hunter can ask to have one question answered and the Romhal will answer it. Or rather, he will conjure a physical object that answers it, a scroll or a piece of stone with the answer inscribed upon it, perhaps, or an audio cassette featuring a recorded response. The Romhal will grant those who find him one such request. Further requests result in violence. Horrid, impossible violence. Because what one can gain from a Romhal is so profound, it should be the focus of an entire story, and not an easy story at that. Mortal and mental peril should await at every turn. The Loyalist of Thule vs. The World of Darkness. The Loyalist of Thule vs. Vampire the Requiem. The threat that vampires pose to humanity is ancient, with roots stretching back further than recorded history. Every society has legends about vampire-like creatures from the Greek Rykolekas to the Malaysian Baja. Translations of stone tablets thought to have originated in Thule speak of monsters that hunted the night for blood. The indebted record and disseminate as many of these legends as possible, including more recent urban myths, to give them a thorough grounding in the appearance and habits of vampires. Vampires are walking, talking storehouses of dangerous occult information. Truly verboten knowledge lurks in the undead minds of creatures who may have been walking around since the concentration camps opened their gates, if not before. Hell, some of the human thralls of vampires were guards at the camps, or were occult archaeologists working for the Third Reich, but have long subsisted on the blood of the ancients and frankly don't look a day over 30. Growing to such an age wears down the mind. Any reliance on human morality winnows to bear slivers, and for some such an ethical code may have not been much to begin with. Couple that with an awful occult knowledge, blood magic, grotesque biological experiments, freaky fascist mesmerist tricks, and a penchant for killing folk to get at their blood, and it doesn't take long for a loyalist to realize what a threat the vampires truly represent. Erosive social influence. Vampires are more than a little fascist, at least in the eyes of the indebted. It seems that most cities suffer under the rule of some kind of blood-sucking autocrat, sometimes called a prince, other times a prefect. Such autocrats, with help of their cabal of like-minded monsters, gladly quash any dissension and ask the lesser creatures support the rule of the greater. The loyalists cannot abide the rule of authoritarian monsters, especially since their monstrous rule often unwittingly extends to the human populace. Corporate records, building inspections, fraud, organized crime, the weave and waft of high society, and so forth. Like any invasive plant, the roots of evil must be torn free from the ground, and burned whenever possible. The loyalists of Thule are rarely found in the thick of the fight, preferring instead to provide backup and advice to other vampire hunters. See, here's the thing. Vampires have secrets, and they guard those secrets with eternal determination. Anytime the loyalists can get a hold of such a secret, they don't keep it to themselves. They share it widely. They'll tell any hunter cell that will listen. Vampires thrive on secrets and hide behind them. Remove the secrets and you've removed their armor. It exposes them. As soon as a loyalist comes sniffing around, the vampire is likely to react. Some are patient and might destroy parts of the loyalist's life over the course of many years. But younger monsters are more impetuous and are likely to come hissing, fangs out, ready to tear the hunter limb from limb. One way to penetrate the monster's society somehow, the penitents of the compact may offer themselves as addicts or slaves to the vampire's wishes, hoping to push past any brainwashing long enough to steal knowledge and get it back to the compact. 
Other loyalists, like members of the Advance, strive to play power games on par with the vampires. They establish themselves as competitors and endeavor to place themselves on equal footing. It doesn't always work that way, of course. Some hunters fail to see just how deep the rabbit hole goes when it comes to the influence of vampire society, but notable gains have been achieved through this methodology, whether it's delving into musty old crypts, or by seizing the libraries and other written works of the vampires. Whatever the occult origins of the vampire is, the loyalists view it as a puzzle to be solved. The Loyalists of Thule vs. Werewolf the Forsaken The Loyalists of Thule know more about werewolves than they let on, which isn't all that surprising, really, considering how their years of painstaking study were perverted by the Nazis when they rose to power in the late 1930s. As most members of the Thule Gechelsaf were being scattered to the winds by Heinrich Himmler's Gestapo, one of the most senior members, an occult scholar by the name of Konrad Sanger, sought power and prestige in service to the Nazis by inflating the egos of high-ranking members of the party and helping refine rationales for Aryan genetic supremacy. Nazi propagandists drank deep from Sanger's wellspring of knowledge regarding the hoary master race of legend, which was bad enough. Later, however, as World War II began and Hitler started to build his thousand-year Reich at Bayonet point, Nazi scientists learned of some of the other secrets contained in Sanger's library, namely his lifelong study of shape changers and their fearsome powers. At first, Sanger was reluctant to share this hidden knowledge until his family was arrested by the Gestapo and sent off to a labor camp to ensure Sanger's complete cooperation. Horrified, the scholar turned over his precious books and consulted with Nazi geneticists to produce some of the most horrific eugenics experiments of the war. Records of the Werewolf Super Soldier Project were lost at the end of the war, and Sanger himself committed suicide suicide in Berlin in early 1945, but it is known that hundreds of prisoners were shipped from Eastern Europe to a research complex in the Aachen Forest and subjected to horrible experiments to determine if they carried the genetic traces of lycanthropy. After three years of horror, the project was shut down as Allied troops approached Aachen and the research facilities were reportedly destroyed. No one knows what became of Sanger's extensive occult library. Some believe it was destroyed during an air raid on Berlin, prompting Sanger's death, while others think it fell into Soviet hands at the end of the war. Regardless, the Sanger affair created a stigma that the loyalists of Thule are still working hard to erase, and as a result the majority of the Compact's members go on great lengths to conceal their dealings with shapeshifters and keep what they learn a closely guarded secret. The loyalists of Thule developed an abiding interest in werewolves through their extensive studies of the spirit world and dialogues with what they believe to be the ancestor spirits from Lost Atlantis. Though these dialogues, many of which survived the war only as handwritten transcripts, the organization's scholars learned a great deal about the ways in which the spirit world interacted with the physical world and gradually realized that werewolves somehow existed in both realms at once. The shape changers were wary and unpredictable creatures and mistrusted the hunter's motives from the start. The the loyalists of Thule also aggressively study and attempt to communicate with denizens of the spirit realm, from the ghosts of dead mortals to more esoteric entities such as nature spirits. Some members of the Compact advocate a more forceful approach in dealing with these spirits, insisting that if they could find a means to entrap them, they could advance their store of knowledge by leaps and bounds compared to the current process of seances and summonings. The approach is gaining more and more converts within the Compact, though to date the scholars have no practical means of reliably uprooting a spirit and containing it. The Loyalists of Thule vs. Mage The Awakening When you carry a secret like yours, it's comforting to know that you aren't alone in your complicity. Yes, the Thule Gesellschaft was there at the foundation of the greatest evil of the 20th century, but you weren't there alone. Others were searching for lost Atlantis, witches and magicians searching for a return of their lost glory, and some of those made alliances even more distasteful than those early loyalists. The loyalists don't have a unified outlook on any one thing, but they do talk. The hunters of this compact are keen, sometimes obsessively so, on sharing information. As such, they don't classify witches as the enemy in a blanket sense the way they do with flesh-eating ghouls or possessing demons. Witches are, if anything, considered a potential source of information. Witches and mages possess the means to unearth knowledge far beyond what ordinary men and women can ever hope to. Nevertheless, as a group of loyalists don't entirely trust mages, the entire concept of certain people being spiritually superior to other men hits uncomfortably close to the memory of the early Thule society's racial theories. Add to that the compact's records, accurate or not, of occultists and witches deeply embedded in the upper echelons of the Nazi leadership, and you have a recipe for deep suspicion. Even witches who don't claim to be superior, by dint of the sorcerer's prowess, are kept at arm's length, and the indebted use them as a source of intelligence only at great need. 
There's no telling how much a witch might learn about you during even a brief interaction, so it's best to keep interaction to a minimum. A fairly common, though usually unspoken, attitude among many loyalists is to quietly blame the horrors of the Nazi regime on Hitler's personal cultists and witches allied with the Nazi party, rather than their antecedents in the Thule Geschelsaft. Certainly, the Thule society bears some of the blame. After all, it was their theories that inspired Nazi ideology and key founding members of the National Socialist Workers' Party, but the real horrors were only devised and executed when the witches moved in. They tell themselves it was the witch covens and their mad quest to recover the lost kingdoms of antiquity, Mu, Lemuria, Atlantis, that engendered the atrocities of the Holocaust, not the academic hypotheses by the Thule society. As evidence, they cite the Compact's own encounters with magicians who still hold to Aryan supremacy ideals. The fact that numerous historians, both of the mundane and of the occult, had dismissed the idea that the Nazi leadership was significantly influenced in any way by practitioners of the occult seldom get mentioned. It is, after all, easier to believe a petty lie than an ugly truth. The loyalists of Thule don't typically take an active hand in the elimination of witches who represent a threat to innocent civilians or to others keeping the vigil, but they certainly make sure something is done about it. Whenever possible, the Loyalists prefer to hand off dangerous magicians to other selves, those with a specialty in dealing with magic and its practitioners. Special ire is reserved for witches with whom the Loyalists of Thule identify with Nazi beliefs and practices. Obviously, witches who espouse Nazi ideals of Aryan supremacy or who invoke their spells through rites and iconography of the Third Reich are hunted down ruthlessly, but the compact is no less vehement in its hatred of mages who practices echo those of Nazi Germany, regardless of the ideology. Aside a sizable faction of the Loyalists of Thule believed the Nazi party was heavily influenced by witches who believed the ideals of racial purity were the key to restoring a long lost golden age of magic. A common belief among many of these hunters is that quite a few of these witches survived the fall of the Third Reich and escaped, as did many Nazi leaders, to countries that lacked extradition treaties with the major allied powers. Further, they believe it very likely that many of these magicians are still alive today. The war was a long time ago, but the indebted know that the witches have many means of extending life at their disposal. In the past, the Loyalists of Thule maintained ties with the so-called Nazi hunters, men and women, many of them Israeli Jews, who devoted themselves to tracking down escaped Nazi war criminals in the decades after the war. At least one Mossad assassination of a death camp commandant in Argentina is rumored to have been the result of a joint operation between the Loyalists of Thule and a local cell of Catholic witch hunters, who may have been allied with the Malleus Maleficarum. The Loyalists of Thule vs. Promethean the Created the Loyalists, unlike other hunter organizations, approach the created from a cerebral perspective. They are likely to run across the notes that led to the creation of a Promethean, rather than the Promethean itself. An ordinary person, even a gifted scholar, reading the journal of a Demiurge, will probably believe the author mad or gifted. The Loyalists can recognize obsession when they see it. Since the Loyalists generally take a pragmatic view of the supernatural, they are unlikely to interfere with the Promethean just going about its life. Unless, of course, disquiet sets in. In that instance, the Loyalists of Thule can be one of the most dangerous groups to cross because they tend to have the ability to dig up information on the created as well as contacts with other, more martial organizations. The Loyalists of Thule vs. Changeling the Lost The Loyalists of Thule's official party line is that changelings do not exist. Not as fey, at least. The Compact's data refers to the Lost as a dangerous supernatural race, of unknown and potentially contagious origins. Compact Loyalists are never assigned to investigate situations or topics related to the Hedge, Arcadia, Hobgoblins, Hedge Beasts, or Changelings. Should such a matter come up on the Compact's radar, all information and leads are to be passed up the chain of command to Munich. Any cell that attempts to follow up on such leads will be severely reprimanded, and potentially be censured for seditious and criminal disregard of the Compact's rules, under a mandate referred to as the Eldraka Errata. The reason for the Eldraka Errata is simple. The true Fae are ancient gods, and Arcadia is the ultimate source. Or, at least that's what the head of the Loyalists fear. In their earliest searches, the Loyalists poured through folklore, myths, and legends, and found that every culture has their own tales of the race that walked amongst humanity, a race who came before, the Fae. Terrified that someone else might find that information and spark a vast genocide, Loyalist leaders simply forbade their members from researching the Fae. The Compact created false truths about the loss, claiming that they are a potentially infectious threat, and insists that all investigations on Fae-related matters are to be handled by specialized teams, higher up in the organization, teams that don't exist. Even with the Aldraka and Rada in place, 
it's impossible to ensure that a loosely knit group of scholars scattered across the globe won't study the topic further. The Loyalist of Thule vs. Hunter the Vigil, World of Darkness, Slasher. It's impossible to avoid. It's as if some cosmic force keeps trouble looking for hunters, no matter how sedentary they are. The scholar who starts asking questions in the neighborhood about the odd little boy who killed his teenage sister all those years ago, and what happened to him might find that little boy is all grown up and still fond of knives. The bookworm, who figures out that the peculiarly high number of fatal accidents that have happened around the popular congressman, might not realize that the congressman knows all about his researches until he's running through the woods, his glasses broken, and his ankle twisted, as someone confident and smiling comes for him with a vicious, heavy, broken branch and the will to use it. The researcher who delves into the archaeological evidence late into the night for the Hag of Nola starts to hear noises in the corners of the museum's storeroom. One of the terrifying things about some slashers is that even if they have no reason to know that someone is researching them, they do. They're often implacable and seemingly omniscient, almost impossible to fool, impossible to trap. And if you're a 90 pound weakling who's never carried anything heavier than a copy of the Summa Theologica, when the monster comes for you, all you can do is run. Sometimes the running gets too much. The weight of guilt constantly put upon the loyalist's shoulders and the knowledge of always being in the sights of any number of terrible supernatural creatures can make a person crack. A smart man or a woman finds a way to fight back. Maybe she begins to wonder if the loyalists really should carry the guilt for things, methods and acts that could perhaps be used to take on the horrors of the modern age. The loyalists of Thule don't like to talk about Valerie Maynard, who somehow managed to rig up a warehouse as a kind of abattoir gas chamber and who tracked down a dozen werewolves. Through trickery, intimidation, ransom notes for already dead children and a dozen other ploys, she systematically wiped out all 12 of the lycanthropes, along with their parents, siblings, partners, and children. In the end, her factory of death was shut down by her own people, who considered what she was doing to be utterly obscene. But not before some of her former colleagues ended up in the gas chamber. The Loyalists of Thule vs. Geis the Sin Eaters The indebted have always known about the Fogmen. In the Second World War, these scholars were at ground zero when the angry dead swarmed Nazi-controlled territories seeking vengeance. The Loyalist records carefully recall how these creatures stood up after dying from grenades, gunshots, and mines, and as they pressed forward, bled fog from their wounds. Many of the Fogmen's victims were guilty, but others were simply targets of convenience, everyday workers who had no part in government or the Nazi regime. The Loyalists, however, thought that the Fogmen held the secrets to eternal life, an enigma the scholars actively sought up until 1945. The indebted knew that the Fogmen were connected to angry ghosts, casualties of war that originated from concentration camps, the SS, and battlefields all over Europe. Now, some indebted believe that the number of Fogmen in the West is a fraction of what existed during the end of World War II. This led to the theory that violent deaths produce more Fogmen, and those deaths yield a specialized type of ghost, a writer of great wrongs. At the same time, when roused to anger, these hunters have seen Fogmen bring about massive destruction with little regard for collateral damage. The source of the Fogmen is open to debate, and these beings often don't willingly disclose their secrets to the Loyalists. While some hunters believe the Fogmen bargained for a new life for the god of the underworld, the truth is obscured across many cultures, many battlefields. What's more, when Fogmen do speak of their creators, they address them in mystic terms. Death lords, horsemen, geis, psychopomps, even gods or demons. Whatever their origins, the loyalists have discovered one damning piece of evidence that leads them to believe the fogmen aren't human. They can travel through the lands of the dead and reemerge miles away from where they were last seen. The indebted's response to the fogmen is nuanced, and hunters are conflicted. The compact as a whole agrees that it's important to ascertain the threat of any given fogmen and decide if dealing with them is worth the trouble. By this point, the Loyalists have dealt with enough Fogmen that they've figured out interviews aren't yielding any new information, so questioning them isn't worth the effort. Instead, they focus their efforts by attempting to locate the doors to the Underworld. It seems that the Loyalists have located a few doors in the past, like the doorway in Berlin, and have studied them extensively. Until very recently, the Indebted have even managed to get some of them open. What they found, however, has given the Loyalists nightmares. Though they expected to find the Fogmen's strange masters, they found an underground land teeming with ghosts. Some were sentient, some trapped in bizarre vignettes, some animalistic. Worse, as the Loyalists peered closer into that unearthly realm, they noticed that all spears were drawn deeper and deeper into those lands, beyond rivers ferried by mysterious and frightening creatures. To date, 
only one cell has managed to journey and return to that doorway. The trip was extremely traumatic for them, and the hunters have since begged to never return. Through those doorways, the indebted may find the answers they seek. To them, navigating the underworld doesn't just require skill, it requires a unique ability the Fogmen seem to possess. The Loyalists of Thule vs. Mummy the Curse New York City, one of the largest ports in the world, has a thriving import and export business that rivals all other cities in the world. And where there are imports and exports, both legal and not, hunters are sure to find magical artifacts, curse relics, blessed amulets, and other curiosities. While the Aegis Kai Doru often chases after such prized objects, in New York City, this conspiracy doesn't have the foothold or the contacts required to be the center of that trade. In fact, thanks to long-standing ties with the longshoremen and dock workers, the Loyalists of Thule have a very good idea of exactly what passes through the New York Harbor. The question is, what's to be done about what comes through? For the last 40 years or so, the Loyalist policy was to catalog who was buying what and track where the inventory went if it left New York. In some cases, the Loyalists would intervene, collecting up partially difficult or dangerous items to prevent them from falling into the wrong hands. Hands like those of the Aegis, who had never done right by the Loyalists of New York. That's all started to change, though, as the Loyalists have been approached by an elderly rabbi named Levy, who has an offer for them. He claims that he can take any ancient artifact they come into their possession, the kind that's too dangerous to exist, and safely destroy it, depleting its energy for all time. He's even gone so far as to tell the Loyalists that he shares their need to work off an old debt. Can the Loyalists trust the rabbi? Can they risk not trusting him? And if they choose to work with him, Aegis Kai Daru become more than an irritant. The Loyalists of Thule vs. World of Darkness, Inferno Scholars often find themselves in conflict or cooperation with cryptics. Both are looking for secrets, and whether the end is the liberation or enslavement of humanity can sometimes seem, well, academic. Usually, a loyalist cell is on a demon's trail for a long while before they suspect what it is. What looks like a human pawn becomes a suspect, and then gradually becomes the center of an investigation. A demon is a horror from beyond, even if that beyond is actually heaven. They need to be destroyed, and the loyalists are very good at accomplishing that. Demons will promise anything, and the worst part is that they deliver. The thing about a good con is that the mark often feels like he's the one taking advantage of the con artist. Demons are very good at disguising their bargains as opportunities, and sometimes try to take advantage of the advance. Often, the indebted come to recognize the devil's deal for what it is, and seek to turn it back on the demon. The Loyalists of Thule vs. Demon the Descent As mentioned before in our previous Hunter videos, for Demon the Descent, there is no given explanation as provided by our sources, so we have to make up our own. I also want to make another disclaimer now because we're kind of on the same subject. I'm only using books that are currently released right now. I know that the Kickstarter manuscript of Deviant the Renegades is out. I'm not including that in any of my guides yet. Just want to throw that out there. But anyways, let's go back to Demon of Descent. During World War II, some of the Earth's most destructive technologies were developed. Weaponry advanced throughout land, air, and sea. The seeds for space travel were planted when the V-2 rocket was created. The Manhattan Project birthed two atomic bombs that extinguished more than 80,000 lives immediately and killed tens of thousands more due to radiation exposure. Unfortunately, this writes itself. Combining these destructive forces with a taste of elite, technologically advanced super soldiers broken off from a mechanical god, and you have a very potent antagonist, or amazing ally, that threatens everything this compact stands for. German science is the best in the world! The Loyalists of Thule vs. Beast the Primordial They have one very, very important purpose for us. They attract others. They consider themselves family to other monsters. And frankly, other monsters seem to agree. We've studied pack behaviors and werewolves, of course. But we've never seen them cohabitating with vampires and stranger things. At least, that is, before we began studying this beast phenomenon. Just to be a fly on a wall of some of those beast layers for a month would be more valuable than a century of book learning. Conclusion So, that's it! I'm going to be very honest with all of you right now. This one was pretty difficult for me to do. The reasoning was because it took me an extremely long time to get into the mindset of who this group was, what their ideals were, and so on and so forth. Now, I've read up on these guys before. However, what I'm about to say is massive. There is a huge difference between reading a book and understanding that book. If you read up on just this group in the core book, you didn't understand it. I'm gonna be very frank with you. Personally, 
until I fully understood them. Within the context of real world history, the books that we use for all these guides, I didn't want to put this one out because frankly, I want to have integrity in what I'm instructing on. When I do these, I want to give you a definitive, complete guide on a group. I respect you all enough to not half do a guide. If I'm doing one, I'm doing it. When I first started writing this, I hated the whole idea of them because I didn't see the big picture. The true value of this group comes as a direct response to the outside, historically significant effort you put into it. It took me about three months in order to articulate what I just said. It's been that long since I started this. I hope that all you awesome Hunter fans understand this and you learn something, or perhaps even like myself, change your entire opinion of this group. I really don't know where to go from here. German science is the best in the world! This has been Nick from the Botch Pit. Thank you.